may not be that smart and they may not be that pretty But they like to talk about Cardiff City It's the view from the ninny and with views from the ninny And not shoes from the ninny and the view from the ninny and... Welcome back to the third episode of the View from the Ninian season. Uh, after a quiet week in the news by Cardiff City standards, there were no sackings, no losses. The Bluebirds travelled to Scab City and came away with three points after a 2-0 win in Nottingham. And breaking this down with me, as usual, is Tom Phillips. Tom, Shamai. Shamai, Ben, how are you? All good, mate. How are you? Very well, very well. And Ben Price. Ben, how are you? What's happening, boys? All right. You're in a vest, I see. Yeah, I've got the wife beater on today. Should you say that on a, on a live podcast? I'm not saying I hit her. I'm just saying I've got a wife beater on. I didn't say that you were. Yeah, you said that there, mate. So you kind of let yourself... Now I sound more there. guilty. Now I sound more guilty, don't I? Yeah, you do. Yeah. Let's just, let's, just, um, let's just leave that there and move on to the fact that I'm on holidays. Um, so I'm recording this from the sunny climes of Greece. I don't have to quarantine on the way back because it's not one of the islands that needs quarantine. And any questions for me about Greece so far, boys? Anything you want to ask me? Um, yeah, that. What was it? What was the question? How's it, How it going? Oh, it's lovely. Um, yesterday, I went and watched the Cardiff game in a bar where the guy didn't put it on the big screen for me, but he, he let me watch it on his laptop. Um, so oh, I sat nice. at the bar watching it on his laptop, and it froze every five minutes. But um, I watched most of the game, so it was um, it was an enjoyable watch. An enjoyable watch. I, just, I sank a couple of mythos while I was watching it, which tastes different when you're in Greece, doesn't it? Legend. And anyway, on that note, with me being in Greece, Tom, I believe you have a, a Greek Cardiff City 11 for me. Yeah, I got um, quite bored. So I thought, you know, let's make a Greek Cardiff City 11 that has Dimi Constantopoulos nowhere near it. Because mm-hmm. um, he doesn't deserve to be. No. Despite no. being Greek, the only Greek person in my Cardiff Greek 11 he would have been. But there we go. The, Dimi the drop, wasn't that? that? That's what we called him. Exactly. So in goal, we've got Neil Alexander the Great. Um, you, you know, Macedonian born, but residency rule and all that. He was king of the Greeks. <laughs> so I think, I think it's <laughs> completely does, fair. Yeah, that does allow you to qualify to play for the national team. I am king yeah. of the country, so I should get a game. Yeah, fair enough, Alex. Yeah, you know, it was controversial at the time, I'm sure. Um, you know, then uh, back four, you've got Greece Western. <laughs> um, classic. Uh, you've got Zantony Gerard. Yeah, good, Zantony Gerard. Drac Mark Hudson, you know, one for the old currency uh, fans out there, that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cyclades Hamilton, that, that's a push, that one. <laughs> <laughs> that is a push, but I came up with that one because I am on the, the Cyclades Islands. So Cyclades <laughs> Hamilton, it works, it works. You've got a Gian Rogerson in the, in, the, in, in the midfield there, alongside Ome Gavin Ray. You know, oh God, <laughs> and, uh, and then Thessaloniki fish. That that's a belter. For, that was you, Ben. Yeah, that was me. Yeah, Thessaloniki fish. Um, it came to me kind of just like a you know out of the blue, and I was very happy with it. And then we've got three up top with Ioni and Walsh. Yep, good. Alongside G Ross McCormack. <laughs> Another good one. <laughs> and, and finally, Herakli on Fortune West. Yeah, I, I came up with that one as well, I must admit, and I was very happy with that one too. Herakli. I've been into Her- Go on. I know, and a big shout out to our chairman as well, Samos Hamam. Um, <laughs> it needs to be mentioned as well. Um, ben, have oh, you got any, addition, any additions that you can think off the top of your head for that? I, I can't add to that, boys. G. Ross McCormack is just peak, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, I mean, it's amazing what being bored on a boat can do for you. Um, so we're pretty happy to bring that one together. Um, and I think we should probably leave it there, really, because some of that was quite a reach. And then uh, I focus on the important things, which is the, the, the Nottingham Forest game yesterday. Uh, obviously, a 2-0 win. Uh, let's get your overall views on it and then dive into it. Ben, what did you make of it? Give me your one-line review. It was really good, wasn't it? Yeah. Tom? Uh, more the same, please. As in M-O-O-R-E. Uh, yeah, exactly. You're on it. Well, you... You have to explain it when you can't, you know, write the jokes down. So. All right. Yeah, all right. Okay. All right. <laughs> Just helping you out there. <laughs> and, and talking of Kiefer Moore, so Ben, he got his, his first goals for the club, one man of the match. Just just how good was he yesterday? Uh, first half, especially outstanding. We'll come on to the second half in a bit. But um, he just put himself about, made himself busy, physical, 
but also have that knack of a striker we've been crying out for of doing the follow-ups and getting into those places like you saw for the second goal mm-hmm. where he wasn't just waiting for something to come to him. He was going into the ch- spaces where the ball's likely to come and that's how the second goal comes from. Mm-hmm. Um, we haven't had a striker that's done that for a long time. Tom, do you agree? Yeah, and like I think for the second goal especially as well, it wasn't like a tap-in. He'd anticipated a flick on from Morrison. He's in the right positions. And like he's lost Riviera twice for both goals, and he's just a pain in the ass with defenders. Yeah. And I just love Neil Harris referring to him as the big man in all press conferences from now on. Just absolutely he's, love it. He is a big man, isn't he? He's what, six foot five? He's a bit of a unit, isn't he? A bit of a unit. He puts himself about. Yeah, I agree with you guys. I think I tweeted something along the lines yesterday, but it was just nice to see a striker getting himself into the right positions. Because you can see it on some of the crosses that are coming in. He's, he's getting into the positions and the other defenders are clearing it. But you can see that he's making the movements. He's steadying himself. So when the ball gets past the defender, he's going to get on the end of it. And I think, you know, as, as much as I like Robert Glatzel, you can, you can almost see the difference in the fact that we've got a striker now who's just getting into the right places each time. And it, it paid off for both goals. I think you say with the second one, the anticipation was almost chopper-esque, wasn't it, Ben? It was. It was just, the, for both goals, the way he's lost his man and sort of moving in one direction, quickly changing the other, changing the, go the other way, sort of shows he's not just a big hoof it up to him and hope he gets on his head. While his first goal was a nice header, your, your classic target man header, um, his movement is quick, agile, and just really shows he is a clever footballer. Mm. And Tommy's kind of bringing that, you know, he, he's in form for Wales, and hopefully this is the start of him being in form for Cardiff, right? Yeah, definitely. And we, ju- we, ca- we did jazz up the play a bit. We, like, it wasn't just lumping it up to him. We were playing balls to feet and like, finding him in channels, then, then mixing it up and putting it in the air a bit. And mm-hmm. Forrest couldn't really deal with it. They couldn't really adapt because they didn't know how we were going to like, go forward. So... It's really promising, actually. We were playing to a strength a lot more. I think the things that were missing in that Sheffield Wednesday game are starting, especially first half, starting to creep through into our play now. So we're talking about the first half, but Ben, let's, you raised it there at the start. Um, the second half, we dropped off a bit, right? Yeah, we didn't really respond. Um, just before we scored that second goal, Forrest put on uh, Taylor and changed their shape to a 4 4 2. And it just doesn't seem like we really responded well to it. We sort of stayed doing what we were doing before but obviously with the change in shape it was a completely different game and sort of the changes Forrest made worked all they didn't do really was put the ball in the net they were quite wasteful they had a couple of good chances that they probably should and look back regret not taking but um, yeah the first start of the second half was just a grind out I think we were happy with the 2-0 I imagine if we'd scored if uh, Forrest had scored it would have been a different situation we would have changed up a bit but um, yeah. It just, yeah, it was just a bit of a disappointing, not a disappointing because we got the win, but it was, it wasn't the full, complete 90 performance that we sort of could do with at the moment. Tom, um, do you agree? You're nodding. I can't, yeah, I kind of agree, but I think we did what was needed. I think we didn't change, we didn't want to kind of upset the apple cart as such, like, so just kind of keep it as it was. Yeah, they had a couple of chances. They will have a couple of chances, but we, we were largely solid. We, there was, the work ethic was there, you know. And yeah, it was far from a polished second half, but it's a clean sheet away from home. So can't really, I completely agree with what Ben's saying. It was far from like a full 90 minute performance, but it was enough. And at, at the second game of the season, I'll take enough. Yeah, I, I kind of uh, I agree with you on that point. I think as much as they brought Taylor on, I didn't think Lyle Taylor offered that much, except for being a bit of a dickhead, kind of throwing himself around and, and trying to push people around a little bit. I think... The fact that there were a lot of fans were kind of pining for him to come and sign for Cardiff, he showed that he's not really, you know, I don't know how much he's going to bring into a game like Keith Moore does for us. Um, and I, I think, I think, yeah, I think we, I think we deliberately took our foot off the pedal in the second half. I think the game was relatively secure, um, and I think they just didn't want to push themselves. Really, I think you know we we seem to have quite a small squad at the moment of players that he's willing to play. Um, I just don't think he wants to kind of risk people so much. But yeah, I, I agree. I think you know the first half we dominated possession, we dominated passing. And then the second half we just let them do the same, and it. It would have been nice to, to see a whole 90 minutes performance, but I think coming away from it, a clean sheet is obviously a, a bonus. And I think, do you think, Ben, then, that the, the unusual subs that came on kind of uh, had an impact on things? He, I, I don't really understand what he did with the subs, really. It was quite confusing at times, the kind of way he, I can't he shifted work out things what, around. I can't work out what formation we, formation we ended with. So the, the, the subs, for anyone who didn't watch, he obviously Bennett went off injured and, and Bamba came on. That was quite late on, 82 minutes. Volks came on for Ojo and, and Tomlin came on for Hoyler, which meant that we brought two wingers off and brought two central midfielders on. We brought a centre-half on for a left-back. 
and we seem to end play playing the game sort of in like a five three two maybe I don't really know. I really can't, I genuinely when I think about it, I can't work out because um, on TV it looked like Bakuna dropped into left back, mm-hmm. and then we were still playing. It was like five at the back. It was just yeah, it was just a football manager sort of situation that you sort of run out of players. It sort of for me highlighted how sort of short we are with a couple of players. Obviously. It was revealed that Murphy was injured, uh, slight hamstring strain. Obviously, Bennett goes off injured, and Cunningham's mm-hmm. obviously not quite ready for uh, the bench. So, um, it just yeah, it just for me, it just sort of highlighted a couple of concerns of just that squad isn't as deep as actually I thought it was at the moment. And Tom, looking at the bench, we had people like Patterson, White, who didn't come on. Would you have made any different changes? Obviously, I think the obvious one is if you're if you're trying to. I don't know, Hoyle for, for White, for example, is probably the, the better change really to keep things in a more natural position or is, is, is it just Harris's will? I, I kind of get why he did it. He brought in a lot of solid players. Do you know what I mean? People who are mm-hmm. going to run around, win the ball. They're defensively minded. We've, the Bamba one, like we've done that before. Like we did it against Preston. We did it against Bristol. We bring him on for the last 10 minutes when we got a lead. The thing is, I don't trust him as much as I used to. I'm no. glad it was a two-goal cushion because if it was a one-goal cushion, <laughs> yeah. it, it really would have been squeaky bum time. But, yep. but I, you know, it worked in a way. So I'm not going to question it too much. And there's a reason I'm not a football manager, and he is. So I'm not going to question it too much. Yeah, I saw I saw someone with a, a tweet or something yesterday. I can't forgive me. I can't remember who it was. So like Mike Bubbins on a socially distant sports bar. I can never remember who's giving him the clips, but. Um, there was a guy who tweeted something like, when I saw... Oh, it was Grant Sheehan. He tweeted saying, um, when I saw the team, I was a bit unsure, but then that's why Neil Harris is a football manager and I play football... Uh, is a football manager and I play football manager. And it is, <laughs> it's kind of a fair point, really. I think, I think there was a, a professional edge to the second half, really, that we didn't have perhaps last week against Northampton that we lacked sometimes last season, really, where we, we let them play the game. We didn't... You know, they, yes, they had a lot of chances in the second half, but was Smithies really ever troubled? I don't think he was. Um, you know, I think Morrison was relatively solid. I think Nelson was back to his solid best at times, and I think that's the I think that's the positives we should take from the second half, really. And I think as the I, you know Harris alluded it into his press conference, I don't think the players are where they where he wants them to be at the moment. So no. maybe in a few in a few weeks' time, we won't do that in the second half because a the players will be fitter, and b we might have the correct kind of backups that he wants to to be able to bring in and, and, and change things. Um, you, you mentioned then that um, Murphy was injured, uh, and then and the next question relates to Murphy in a, in a roundabout way. Is Ojo, Ojo, I keep saying Ojo, I think he's because I think he's Spanish or something. Is Ojo going to be this season's Josh Murphy? Got a lot of grip, creep on Twitter over the two games. Um, I, I, you know, what do you think? Do we need to be more realistic on time frames for players to settle in? I think we do. Um, I just saw a lot of people expecting Ojo to come into that squad and understand everyone right away and sort of play like a world-class player. Mm-hmm. He's come from an average loan spell at Rangers who themselves admit he's not the quickest and not the best. <laughs> and we're expecting him to be an, come like, be an absolute storm. I think the, the one pass where he should have squared it to Rolls instead of taking that shot at the near post was frustrating. Mm-hmm. Other than that, he wasn't like, it wasn't a man of the match performance, but I don't think he was that bad. He was just a bit quiet. But um, you just see some of the flack. People, people just can't wait. It just seems sometimes people can't wait to get on players' backs. Do you think that's a... Uh, and I'll come back to you on this one, Ben. Do you think that's a mismatch in expectations that we wanted someone who was, you know, we need a better player than Tomlin to replace Tomlin, right? And we signed Ojo for now. And people are already down on him because he's not the player we expected to sign, if that makes sense. Do you think that yeah, comes into it? probably is that. It's sort of... You, there's certain players that come into the club that are never going to stand a chance no matter what. Most of the Russell Slade signings come to mind for that. Yeah, yeah. And they're always just, they, they've got that vibe of just, they're not who the fans expected. They're not what the fans want. But I also sometimes feel we could have signed Bale on loan from Madrid and some fans would, would have complained about that. Yeah, they would have complained about his age and the fact that he's probably a bit expensive. I, I, I agree with you on that point. Tom, I mean, were, were you encouraged by Ojo yesterday? Do you think he had, I thought he looked okay. I, I think he was solid, he, if unspectacular. I thought he played well. Um, I think he did. He did the basics right, largely throughout the game, and there was a bit of threat there. Do you know what I mean? Going forward, he, he yeah. caused a few problems, um, and I think you know, he's only going to get better from here. Like he's two games in without a preseason, I think it's promising, and I think yeah, give, give the block a chance. I think we'll judge him now in five, five, ten games time to see if he's had an impact. I thought he had a good game yesterday. 
Yeah, and I think I think there's I think to, to your point then about the the kind of do we need to be more realistic on time frames? We we haven't had a long preseason. We've had a shortened preseason and a longer last season. So therefore, that that middle period is a lot shorter. So players don't have the same bedding in time. They don't have the long call of month or so preseason where they can come in and, and learn with the players. Ojo's come in, you know, what was it after the Northampton game before the Sheffield Wednesday game? So he's not had a full full amount of time with the squad. So. I do think that, and, 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 and especially this season with everything that's gone on, there just needs to be a bit more grace for people. Otherwise, we're just going to be writing off players left, right and centre. Um, we, we, we talked about Greg Cunningham earlier. Joe Bennett obviously went off injured yesterday. I think we should give, give props to Joe Bennett. 150 games for the club, um, which is quite impressive, really, as a, as a player who kind of came in during... Um, what era did he come in? Did he come in the slate or was it under Trollope? He was under Trollope, wasn't he? Yeah, he was just that season when Fabio had left. Yeah, he, he replaced Fabio. Um, probably going to be missing next week, Ben. Do you think that's a, a big miss? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, I think he's been all right the last couple of weeks. Um, finished the season strongly as well. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a bit shaky at the start after the sort of reboot. But yeah, I think he's a miss. He's, quite, he's looking good on the ball. His passing's got a lot better recently. Um, and we've also got the issue that Cunningham, like we said before, is coming back from a major injury. We don't know how up to speed he was. Um, the, v- the feedback we sort of got from the Swansea game was that he's not quite there yet. He's still mm. struggling to get that sort of match sharpness back. There's only one way if you'd get match sharpness that's playing matches. Yeah. But um, yeah, Ben, it's going to be a massive loss if he's out. Um, it's a shame to see him go down. Tom, would you, would you, would you throw Cunningham back in or would you, I don't know, give Baggin a go? I'd probably throw Cunningham in. I think he's the pedigree he had before the injury. You know, he's now sort of the game and stuff. I know we've got to try people at times, but I don't think this is, I don't think this is it. I think, you know, we're on the back of a decent clean sheet and stuff. Let's get some experienced heads in there. Um, if Bennett doesn't play, it is a big loss. I don't think he gets the credit that he deserves at the time because he is a dependable player and there's a reason he's got 150 games for us. Like, he's, he's a very, very good footballer. Um, but yeah, kind of, um, yeah if, he, if he plays like he played before the injury, then we've got nothing to worry about. But let's hope his match fitness is up to scratch if he does come in. Yeah, and he's also got, <clears throat> Joe Bennett's also got lovely, lovely teeth, so we'll miss that, that kind of blinding smile while he's on the pitch as well. So um, all the best to Joe Bennett, hopefully he does recover in time. Um, I think someone mentioned this is what, our sixth win in a row uh, or something like that at the City ground, Ben. Um, yeah, our record is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. I, I, think, I think the first away game I went to many, many years ago was a nil-nil draw there. And I don't think we've ever really lost there in time. I even remember the, the promotion season when, Kavanagh, Earnshaw went there and it was our second game of the season. I think Nottingham Forest were quite fancy to go up and we beat them 2-1 at the City ground. Um, back in 2003, 2004, I think that season was. So it, it always seems like a good place to go. Is that because we're, um, Ben, always avenging the minors? Yeah, I think it's just purely because we're not scabby bastards. Yeah. And sort of that, no matter where you're from, that runs deep and no one wants to get beaten by a scab. If yeah. anything, we want, we want to pick them off. <laughs> pick them off and throw them in the bin. Um, exactly. I mean, we went there last year, Tom, and we, we I think we beat them 1-0 with about 28% possession with Nathaniel Mendes-Lang, RIP, scoring the um, the winning goal there. Um, it's just a nice place to go, isn't it? It's a nice nice little ground, proper old school football ground, and, and we seem to win there. Yeah, it's great. Like, so the, the start is, like, they, it's, we, they've lost their last six home matches against us, and it's their worst home losing run against any opponent in their history. In their history. Which, in their history, which is an absolute lovely start. I think of all the teams they played there as well. But yeah, it's a lovely ground to go to. Um, it, you can imagine the scenes yesterday, a two, going 2-0 up there, can you, if there was fans in the ground. Not to like harp on about it, but like yeah. it would have been absolutely brilliant. But yeah, it's a lovely ground. I, I like going to Nottingham for sport, like in general. It's a, it's a great place to go to. I believe the phrase yesterday would have been limbs, wouldn't it? Yes, I believe so. I think that's what the <laughs> youngsters are saying. That's your scenes. Pure scenes and limbs is what people are saying on the internet. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, I'll hold my hands up here. I, I, I think Marlon Pack yesterday was very good. Um, despite me at the start of the season saying I think he, he could be one of the players that leaves, I think he showed yesterday that he's got a part to play in this team. And um, I think, I think the, the one thing I noticed from him in the first half especially was that he was, he was just very aggressive. He was very aggressive at breaking the lines. He was getting out to players and, and trying to close them down and get onto the ball. And uh, Ben, is that the kind of what we want to see from Marlon Pack. Obviously, we, we lost Gunnison and he came in and people thought that he was a kind of replacement for Gunnison. He's not the same player as Gunnison, but he showed yesterday that he can, he can have a bit of the aggressive edge that Gunnison brought, can't he? Yeah, I think it's sort of the early days of Marlon Pack when he first came in. Um, 
he sort of channeled that again and it's exactly what we want from him. Um, simple passing, but played it forward, looked, looked to get the ball out wide to the right players and just wasn't afraid to get stuck in. Absolutely loved him. I thought he was superb. I thought, I thought the midfield three first half were really, really good. Yeah. Yeah, I think we'll come to the question about roles a bit later on because obviously he's playing in at number 10. But um, Tom, do you think Bakuna was kind of back to his back to his best? Yeah, there wasn't any silly passes, giving away goals, or anything like that. I think he was, you know, he's been quite solid and dependable in uh, like eight out of 10 games over the last like mm-hmm. ha- ha- like six months or so. So yeah, it was great to see him kind of step up. And like back to um, Pack as well, like he set up, it was his cross for the first goal. It's his throw that led to the second goal. And, you know, I, I think... You can see that aggression there, and I think that's from you slagging him off in four four two, saying that he should be sold. So <laughs> I think it's I think it's down to you, really, Ben. He's probably, he's probably got that on his um, he's got that on his locker, and he's just looking at every <laughs> yeah. game going, "I'm going to prove him wrong." Um, him and Aidan Flint huddled around each train session. Go on, mate. We'll we'll prove this prick wrong. <laughs> the dark yeah, yeah, well, well, Aidan Flint can't prove me wrong because he isn't playing. So um, fuck him. <laughs> 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 I'm joking, Aidan. Don't come beat me up. You're bigger than me. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll end the Nottingham Forest recap here. We're looking at the former players. So, obviously, yesterday we were up against a couple of former Cardiff players in, in Sami Amiobi and um, a player who wasn't in the squad. But Sami Amiobi, um, Tom, he was kind of back to his inconsistent best, wasn't he, yesterday? Because at Cardiff, he, he showed flashes and could have been a brilliant winger, but he never really did it week in, week out. And I think last year he had a good season at Forest, but he just wasn't at the races yesterday, was he? Yeah, exactly that. He had his flashes again yesterday. He took a long time to get going in that game. He caused a few problems late on, but it was, mm-hmm. the, game, the game was almost gone. It's, he's one of those players that will frustrate the breath out of you. He, he does some absolutely brilliant things, but he went missing for oh, probably an hour or so of that game. And then looked like they, alongside Taylor, looked like their main threat then towards the end of the game. And mm-hmm. I'm glad he's with them and not us now because, yeah, he's some great things, but he just absolutely frustrates me. It's, it's a funny one, isn't it? Ben, because he's exactly the kind of player that Cardiff seems to attract, but we, we didn't take up the opportunity to sign him when we did. And do you think it was a lucky escape, or do you think we've just got, you know, uh, our Ojo Murphy, the kind of next incarnation of Amiobi? Inconsistent, but can be good. No, I think both are a step up from Amiobi. Um, I can't stress this enough. I think Sammy Amiobi is a fucking woeful footballer. <laughs> I think he's absolute dog shit. Um, I think he's just a dangly wobbly freak that just I don't get how he gets really he's not blisteringly quick he's just sort of awkward to run against yeah um, yeah I'm just I would not put them in the same breath as Amiobi I think Murphy Ojo my nan are all better on the ball <laughs> the player in the day uh, yeah she was good for what was it um, bass leg under 12s I don't know why I picked <laughs> that area of the world um, uh, pretty good <laughs> Um, it was close. Um, yeah, I think I think Amiobi's all legs, isn't he? He's just like you know, he's got probably a, a half a foot body and then six foot legs because he's just. It is. A, it's a really weird proportioned thing. Yeah. He's like sort of ninety, like you said, ninety percent legs, and then just his torso is really, really like. It's just he's a strange looking man. He is a strange looking man, and, and the other winger who wasn't playing was someone that Fort Forest were absolutely desperate to get back at the end of last season, Albert Adoma. Do you think Ben that somewhere? After yesterday's performance, Adoma was, you know, sat with a wry smile because he's not involved at Forest at the moment. Not really sure what they're, they're doing with him. I think he's got a year left on his contract. But they were so desperate to get him back last year. It's, it's odd that they're not playing him. I don't think it's odd. I think it was just pure gamesmanship from last year. They didn't want to, they, they I, don't want him in the squad. I know um, that. I think, <laughs> it's I don't a joke. Think... <laughs> <laughs> take everything I, I, I think so seriously. I think he's just too busy doing giveaways for all the football shirts yeah. he's got in his uh, Instagram. I think he's just had an absolute rollicking from the missus. He's told, right, yeah. sort this out. Sort this attic out. Get rid of this. And he's thought, what better way to do it than pushing the social media? Have you thought about entering any of those competitions, Ben? Are you good with your feet? I have, but like Sammy, Ami- Sammy Amiobi, I am a fucking woeful footballer. <laughs> all legs. All legs again. Um Right, well, we won't end the Nottingham Forest recap there. We've got our, um, our roving, intrepid reporter, uh, Hugh Phillips. Um, he's he's um, Tom's dad, basically, but he's a, an amateur journalist. And he's basically, every week now, after the games, we're going to get a Hugh from the Ninian uh, involved. So let's go over to Hugh now for his Hugh from the Ninian for this week. Well, one more goal in, it would have been a hot trick. Brilliant, incisive reporting there from Hugh. So, so Tom, your dad, uh, you know, what's he like at an away game? 
Loves it, you know. Um, has to travel further, you know, from Kamar than the night after uh, most of the time. So, a bit drunk turning up. Um, lo- loves the game. Off he goes home. <laughs> That's it. No, yeah. no incidents. No I forgot you. I, f- I forgot he listens to this as well. So I've got to be careful. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, so, I'll, 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 I'll save you. I'll save you out there and leave it. Uh, leave it there and move on to the the random transfer of the week. So we touched on former players for for Nottingham Forest, but. I'll go over to you on this one, Ben. Uh, do you want to explain this week's... Obviously, the first random transfer of the week was Reece Healy to Toulouse. This one's slightly less exotic, isn't it, Ben? It is. It's a bit of a downgrade when you're thinking <laughs> Toulouse, a wonderful sunny part of France. Uh, this week, we're looking at everyone's favourite drink-driving Scotsman. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ross McCormack finally got out of his broken gates in Birmingham and has made his way to Aldershot Town in the National League. Aldershot Town. Uh, do you know anything about the town of Aldershot, Ben? Is there any, any, any you know, delights you can regale us with? Um, I know it's where like, army officers go, so it's full of fucking Tories. Mm-hmm. So McCormack will fit in well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've just looked it up on Wikipedia. Um, the Aldershot urban area has a population of 243,344, making it the 30th, 30th largest urban area in the UK. So... A big town for McCormack to go to. A lot of pubs. A lot well, of pubs. well, I, I went there. I went to watch Aldershot Late in Orient, as you do. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have the best crinkle cut chips um, offering I've ever had at a football ground, to be fair. <laughs> and, and, and it's some solid cheesy chips there. So McCormack looks like he's lost a bit of weight, but he might end up putting it straight back on, you know, if he uh, samples the delights of the, of the catering services there. <laughs> I mean, it's it's all it's all fun and games, but McCormack's thirty four. He's not that old, and it's a it's a big fall from grace, isn't it? For a man that was what twenty five million pounds worth of transfer fees between Fulham and Villa, yeah, um, it's a sad end to a, like what is what was a really successful career. We all know the Villa moved in work out, and there's obviously some personal issues that went along with that, but um. He's, I, it's just a surprise to see him down in that sort of area. I thought when he went out to the A-League, um, I watched quite a bit of the A-League, lived out in Australia for a bit and then sort of followed Perth Glory very vaguely. So sort of seeing him out there, I thought he'd be the perfect fit out there. I thought he'd mm-hmm. absolutely love it. Bang goals in for fun and sort of, again, be another one of those players that sort of raises the profile. You look at Craig Noon and Adam LaFondra out there at the moment having a great time. Yeah. Um, I thought he'd, be, he'd fall right into that and someone would take him up. Um, see him sort of go down to this level. It might be what makes him happy, though. He might have some mates there, sort of just rekindle his love and sort of finish his career there. So hopefully just, he's happy with it. Yeah, I was trying to work out if Aldershot do have any money because they've signed um, a few good players from the kind of lower reaches of the, the national leagues and things like that. And obviously McCormack's often becoming cheap, um, but I can't seem to see if they have got a money man. Tom, do you, do you think he'll tear it up in the conference or the national league as it is known now? What well, do You'd think so, wouldn't you? <laughs> like um, you'd hope some, so. You'd hope so. But there's some decent teams down there now. As yeah. Well, it's not going to be. It's not complete pub football. Do you know what I mean? It's not like he's going to. No, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a largely professional league now. Um, yeah, exactly. As I understand it. Yeah, but well, you, you'd think he'd score at least twenty goals down there. But yeah. we'll have to keep. We'll have to keep an eye. Well, we'll have to keep an eye on it. I think. I think he got rich after the because I think he was because he was in the squad or he was on the books of Villa when they got promoted, mm-hmm. and he had written into his contract that he'd have a massive pay rise when Villa went up, and he got a bonus. Obviously, written. You into get his like contract. a two million bonus or something, something like, like that in that season. So it could well be that he doesn't need to earn money anymore because if he's got you know a bit of cash just sitting away, he can just go and play football for fun, which I think. It's what a lot of people, you know, when they get to their, their, the latter stages of the career, that's what they want, isn't it? They just want to play somewhere where they're loved. And he's obviously going to be a big star in the conference and, and playing a, you know, I'd say the conference standard has improved in recent years from watching even lower leagues than, the, you know, I watched Essex Senior League and things like that. That, that level has improved down there as well. So maybe it's, it's as good as League One or League Two used to, used to be, um, you know, so the, the level is in comparison. So... Who knows what will happen? But, I, you know, while we're talking about Ross McCormack, Ben, what was your favourite Ross McCormack moment at, at Cardiff? I just think the whole last year at Ninian Park, yeah. uh, the way he played that year was just, he was unplayable, wasn't he? At times, he was, just yeah. absolutely. And then um, I think the one that stands out the most is not being brought on for Bothroyd in the playoff final. He didn't, he was he on the bench for that game. I, could, I never remember who was on the bench. He was on the bench, and Dave Jones thought he'd bring on Kelvin Atua instead. And why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? 
Calvin Atuhu, a well-known target man. <laughs> <laughs> and Tom, your favourite McCormack moment? I think, like Ben says, just the whole of that season, just... But the thing, though, is just we couldn't seem to fit him into the team at times because we had too yeah. many striking options. So I think my memory is just kind of just a frustration of we don't have to play Bothroy, Chopper and McCormack all at the same time because yeah. it just didn't work. So I think it's almost like a what could have been for me. Like I don't quite yeah. look at it as kind of nostalgic as other people do. Um, and I think he, you know, he scored a lot of goals for us, especially in that one season. But it, yeah, it's how would have could, uh, what could have been definitely. I'll always let's remember. Not for, let's not forget we're a club that turned down was it six million from Hull for him when he went up when Hull got promoted. Yeah, only yeah. twelve months later, selling for a quarter of a million pounds to Leeds United. Yeah, yeah and then what Leeds sold him for eleven million quid eventually. Eleven, yep. Uh, it's, 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 it's a bit of a matter. I think I, the game I remember from that that last season at Union Park was the Burnley game where we beat them three one. Um, we were, what was it, one all? he scored a penalty and then uh, right towards the end of the game he had that breakaway goal where he just legged it down the one side of the pitch and, and scored that. I remember that because there was a guy at the ground next to me who'd had a £10 bet on Cardiff to win 3-1 and when the third goal went in it was something like 88-1 to one, so he won the best part of a grand. He, I've never seen someone celebrate so wild. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, I'm not going to tell my missus about that. So if his missus is listening, um, he never won that bet. <laughs> Um, let's go to the Twitter questions before we get into the, the preview against Reading next week. Um, so, so James Roberts asks, uh, when Tomlin is injured, is Joe Riles a good backup at number 10? He made some brilliant runs yesterday and could have scored a couple. Reckon it could be a solution if he can keep that level of performance. So I've got my views on this. Tom, I think you have different views. Um, we'll go to Ben first, then we can reveal ours. Ben, what did you think of Riles yesterday at 10? Uh, I thought he was pretty good. Um, I don't think he's an out-and-out -out proper 10. I don't think it's, it's a permanent option. Um, we need someone else that can create a bit more. Riles just made a couple of good runs into the box and probably should have been used a bit more, uh, mm -hmm. knocking the ball across. But um, long term, I think Joe Rolls' best visit, best games come from going box to box and work coming from a bit deeper and sort of creating the play from there. Yeah. Um, me, he's not a 10. No, he's a 10, a 10 in looks, but not in... <laughs> oh, yeah, he's a, he's a stone cold man on the a stone cold stunner. 11 out of 10 for me. Uh, Tom? It just sums up. Cardiff fans in general last week after the Wednesday games oh, like oh, keep rolls anywhere near from attacking play and stuff like nowhere near 10 and then this week oh yeah we should probably use him as <laughs> an outlet <laughs> but like he's just he's just stocked up and he like he, he's there at the moment to kind of fill it's obvious we need a little bit of reinforcement in that area and he's a quality footballer so he's not going to set the world alight in that position but I think he's good enough to adapt to do a job in a game like Forest away like that and like he will score the odd goal as well he's, he's a quality finisher at times uh, a bit rusty yesterday but I think you know he, he could do a job there if we needed it yeah he I, I, there was that one run in particular wasn't there where he got in behind the defenders and, and um, Kiefer Moore put the ball in front of him and he just slipped over it a little bit mm. otherwise he probably would have scored then Look, I think I, I like you know I'm probably Joe Riles' biggest fan um, I will happily, I think when we were at the Brighton away game, Tom, we were, we were cheering everything he did because other people were happy to criticise him. And I think, <laughs> yeah. I think he's, he's, he's good. He could be good at number 10, but I think, I think there needs to be more work done in there, right? Because he's obviously just being thrown in as a, as a stopgap. And I think he's got the attributes. I just think it's, it's not going to happen overnight. And I think, yeah, as a stopgap and as, as a different type of player to Tomlin, because I, I love Lee Tomlin. I think Lee Tomlin's class, but he's not involved in the game all the time. He was better at doing that last year, but there were, you know, he tends to drift in and out. While Joe Riles, I think, he has a need to be involved in the game more and more. Like he likes to get on the ball. He likes to be that kind of metronome who takes the ball from defenders and makes the options. So I think the number 10 doesn't necessarily work to, to his best abilities either. But I think he, I think he was more than solid there yesterday. And I'd be, I'd be, I'd, I'd quite like to see him get more of a creative outlet to him because everyone knows he can pass the ball. Everyone knows he can whip across him. And I would just like to see him <clears throat> just getting on the ball a little bit more in, in those dangerous areas. Um, Connor Griffiths asks a much better performance first half from the boys this, this week what do you think needs to happen for us to become a serious contender for the promotion race I mean from my perspective and I'll answer this first because this has come straight into my head it's just maintain that first half performance right I think we showed in that first half that we're uh, you know Nottingham Forest are highly fancied and we were, we were we outclassed them in that first half we can pass the ball around now we were you know I think 52-53% possession in the first half we outpassed Sheffield Wednesday yesterday let's do more of that and just make ourselves a bit more dangerous in the box. I don't know if you guys have got anything to add to that, but that's just my view. 
Um, I think what we need that as well is depth or just a lot of luck when it comes to injuries. I think mm-hmm. we like three or four injuries and we are looking thin. Like, yeah. we instantly just lose a bit of quality for backup. If we need to change a game, we've got nothing to come on. Mm-hmm. So I think, yeah, either some a couple of more sign-ins or just luck. But like, I completely agree with you. We've got to start games well. Because it, and we needed to do that yesterday because we took a lot of like the players took a lot of abuse after that first game and rightly so because we were mm-hmm. completely off the boil, but yeah we've got to start game strongly and then kind of just maintain and like we can shut a game out we've proved that if we get an early goal I will back us to win that game yeah but yeah so yeah like you said start strongly and a bit more depth and I think we've got a real a real shot Ben I can't argue with that either of that I think consistency is key for us this season um. Like you boys said, and yeah, just a bit more depth, and we'll be right up there. Right. Uh, Ashley asks on a scale of one to Patterson on MD 2020, how pissed are we getting when Big Keith wins the Ballon d'Or? Ben, let's come to you first. I think a solid pato on three bottles of MD 2020 is needed. Yeah, three bottles of that, Tom. Yeah, I think first kid would be called Keith, uh, girl or boy. Um, <laughs> But, you know, the, the, the Ballon d'Or bandwagon is rolling now. I see Sky Sports were even tweeting Keith and Moore for Ballon d'Or yesterday. I mean, it's, ha- it's happening, boys. It's yeah, happening. The, word, the word of mouth is happening. I think if I was going to say I'd be four cans of dragon soup and one bottle of MB 2020 if Keith and Moore wins the Ballon d'Or. Um, so my stomach would be good the next day. We need to work with some club because obviously it's um, like international captains get a vote. Mm-hmm. I think like Bale needs to have a word while he's at Tottenham with Harry Kane. <laughs> yeah, go look, Harry. You don't have to put him first, but give Kiefer one nomination because I just think it'd be funny for him just to get one nomination for the Ballon d'Or. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I just like I like the idea of sort of <laughs> who went like Salah, Messi, and Kiefer Moore being like Harry King, <laughs> Harry King's nominations. I just love that idea. <laughs> I mean, I think it could happen. You know, I think he's he's proven himself. Um, I'd say he's better than Harry Kane, so maybe Harry Kane will realise that and go. Actually, I yeah. I don't even want to vote for myself. I need to vote for. For Big Keith. Um, and the last question, I, you guys might not remember this, but I certainly do. The underdog, um, B-A-W-G, that's why I said it like that. Do you remember when Timmy Mallet tried to break the Mallet's Mallet world record at halftime at a game at Ninian Park? Probably the most random halftime entertainment ever. And very nicely, hope you're well, Timmy. So, Timmy, if you are listening, hope you're very well. Uh, do either of you remember this? Because I do remember it. I... Um... It's been brought up a few times and I went down a bit of a rabbit hole looking at like the stories about it before and I found a line and I, um, I said, the halftime entertainment, in inverted commas, at Ninian Park last night involved former wide awake club store with Timmy Mallet hitting supporters over the head with his trusty rubber baton. Forget the terraces, Mallet, <laughs> Mallet would have done a lot better going into the Bluebirds dressing room and cracking a few skulls in there instead. <laughs> so that's the, ma- that's the match report I've got open. It's from Wales Online. <laughs> Um, is it? T- yeah. Well, I don't know who it is because the, the author's been taken off it, um, which could suggest it could, it could have been Tucker, uh, the late Steve yeah. Tucker, because uh, he didn't mince his words. But there are some cracking lines in this. So I, I, I do remember the Timmy Mallet thing. I looked it up. Um, apparently, he hit a thousand Cardiff City fans' heads in five minutes. And he did it because he was doing pantomime in Porth Call because it was a December <laughs> game. And he came down as part of the promotions about Porth Call. He broke the world record, as I understand it. A thousand Cardiff City fans malleted in five minutes. And I do remember it happening. But um, Alan Pardew, it was against Charlton this game. Um, I mean, some of these lines, um, Ch- Dave Jones' charges were back to their lamentable worst against a Charlton side who were compact, hardworking, and quite frankly, too good for the Bluebirds. Um, unsurprisingly, given the slight improvement of fortune recently, Jones went for that. Da, da, da. He called the luckless Roger Johnson drop to the bench. I never know when Roger Johnson was luckless. Uh, I thought it was all right. Indeed, Cardiff were tending to overcomplicate matters in the final third, never playing one pass when three would do. And inevitably, the visitors got a foot in and broke things down. I mean, that's, that's Dave Jones's Cardiff City in a sentence, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. That really uh, um, sewed it up quite nicely. In a new twist, the Bluebirds were booed off at halftime. Oh, I love that. <laughs> it's, it's quite a crushing match report. Ben, I don't suppose you remember Timmy Mallet being there. I don't. I really don't remember it. Um, like, sort of, I saw this tweet come in. I was like, I've got to put this in because I need to hear. I need to know more about this. Yeah, they, <clears throat> there are some photos of it exist somewhere. I think if you go on Getty Images, you can find them, and there are a few photos floating around on the internet. 
um, about it. So maybe we can we can put a tweet out with the with the photos. But um, that was a strange time in Cardiff City's history, wasn't it? Uh, I do remember some of the <clears throat> the, after, the half-time entertainment we did have, which was stuff like uh, Wicks, was it on me shed, son? We had to kick the ball into the shed. Yeah, um, classic. Uh, I took part in one half-time game where I had to get the ball in the goal from the halfway line without it bouncing. I went on the Indian Park pitch at half time and I just missed. It wasn't far. I just missed. Um, and you realise how big the bloody pitch is when you get on there. Because I play 11 a side, but those pitches aren't as big as an actual football pitch, obviously. And Indian Park is quite a small pitch. Um, so, yeah, I, I tried my best with that. Have you guys ever, Ben, have you ever taken part in any half time? I know you've been pitch side when you were at a wedding, right? Yeah. Um, the only thing I've sort of done with that was uh, on my mate's wedding day, it was the game of uh, New- Cardiff, Newcastle, the first game, the home game in the Premier League. And he selfishly arranged to get married that day. <laughs> so obviously I was best man. Um, we sit all sit next to each other. My missus. Always, is. Ben. Always best man. You're always best man. Cheers. I'm like Miro. <laughs> and only a few people get that. but Yeah, I didn't it. get it. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so I took him. Uh, yeah, we arranged with the club to go half. And he walked the ball out in his wedding suit. And we left at half time. I do, I do, yeah, we then I, made I do the remember that. wait outside. Um, while the rest of the game was finished, um, taking the penalty, uh, watching it on some guy's phone. <laughs> Did you delay the wedding? Delayed the wedding to watch the last couple of minutes because it was a penalty, yeah. Unbelievable. That's commitment to Cardiff City. And, and Tom, you, you, you know, were, were you ever on the pitch? Have you ever been on the pitch? I played a game in the Cardiff City Stadium um, when I was like working as an intern there. But I think the closest I've got to like half-time entertainment was I had to kick the ball off a stage into the back of a Renault McGann, live on Bridge FM in MacArthur Glen. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, yeah, it was just a shopping up there. They were doing like a radio promotion and they were sponsored by like Renault. And they had like a little platform set up and I had to kick a ball into the boot of a Renault McGann to win a Sondaco football from like Sports Direct. Could you I win? I would win the McGann. No, yeah, I that's what... I won the, no, I won the ball. <laughs> <laughs> a three quid football. Yeah, class, it's free though, isn't yeah. it? So. Uh, it is free, it is free. Um, talking of, of free things, it's now the preview against, uh, that's not a link, uh, preview <laughs> against Reading next week. Um, so Reading. Preview. Freeview. Uh, somehow, Reading are top of the table. Um, Reading seem to be, I don't know if they're a bogey side, but we never seem to do very well against Reading, do we? I think the games that always stand out for me was when we drew it in 2 all, where, um, was it Mikhail Leisure would punch Michael Chopra? Um, obviously, last week's horror show. I mean, Adam Federici scored in the 96th oh, minute yeah. against us to get a, oh, get a draw for them. So, I, I, is it away from home? I, I presume it's away from home. No, it's at home. Uh, oh, is it at home? Uh, yeah. I just thought we were going back to back uh, home and away fixtures. So at home, Ben, what do you think? Do you fancy us? I mean, Reading can't. Reading aren't all of a sudden that good, are they? I don't get Reading because my mate's a big Reading fan, and he sort of was filling me in on sort of what that has been going on at that club over mm-hmm. the last well over the summer. They've gone under the radar as an absolute basket case of a club. Yeah. Um, they had a spe- spell in a week of. Uh, Moving their head of head of their manager to head of football, Ala Russell mm-hmm. Slade, but he somehow managed to last a lot, lot, a lot shorter period than Russell Slade. Um, hired a new manager. The new manager came in and then said, "I don't want him," and sack the man that got him the job. Mm-hmm. Quite right. <laughs> um, after well, to be fair, he did give himself the job before. Yeah. <laughs> then the owner decided here there was a breach in FFP rule. And said you could, uh, it's not going to be as strict. And went, fuck it, I'm going to spend a fortune and get us promoted this year. God. They then signed a, a hired a manager who needed to quarantine for two weeks <laughs> before coming in. They at one stage decided to ho- do a pre season tour in a country where they returned. They'd have to um, quarantine for two weeks, meaning they'd missed the start of the season. And it was only the last minute of the FA saying, if you do this, um, you'll forfeit the game before they cancelled their pre-season tour. So, and, and somehow they're top of the table. And somehow, with the, there's a ton of other stuff. I need to, I, I'll find the thing and post it on Twitter about what's sort of gone on at Reading. And despite all that, the players have somehow managed to focus and go top of the table. Well, I mean, I just looked at their results. Obviously, they, they beat Derby in the first game of the season. That's all well and good. Uh, yesterday, they beat Barnsley. Barnsley were down to nine men. 
Um, and I, I think they had the first place sent off after 42 minutes, their first place sent off after 68 minutes, and Reading didn't actually score until the 57th minute. So they, you know, I'm not trying to take anything away from Reading. I'm just trying to temper expectations here. Obviously, Reading came good in the last couple of minutes of that game. They did lose to Luton, I think, in the Carabao Cup. Um, I don't know what kind of team they played, but it's, it's going to be one of those games, isn't it, Tom? I, I, I always dread games against Reading for the reasons I laid out. We always seem to do badly against them. They've obviously signed, was it Ajaria this summer, who was brilliant for them last year. They've still got people like Pushkas. Lucas Xiao seems to be in form. Um, they've got John Swift still, who obviously was brilliant last year as well. I mean, what's your views going into the game, Tom? Do you, do you think we've got enough to beat them? Yeah, we've got nothing to fear. Like that win um, against Barnsley was only the second home win of 2020. And their mm-hmm. last one was 2 0 against Barnsley in March. Like they're not setting the world alight. They've been very poor. And like, yeah, they've got Zhao and Pushkas. But like, you look at the game yesterday, Zhao went out in a massive poody walking off the pitch because he'd got no service all massive night. So they've poody. So like, they've, they've got like, They've got some great strikers, but again, zero service at the moment. And it did take drop into nine men before they opened. Ba- well, they didn't even open Barnsley up at that point. They just got they scored one volley from outside the box, which is a cracking strike by their eighteen-year-old academy product. And mm-hmm. the first goal was an absolute scramble. So we'll probably lose three 0 but you know, <laughs> <laughs> but no, but there's nothing. There's nothing to fear with them. Um, we we sh- it's a game we should be winning. And Ben, you know, we, we talked at the top, obviously Bennett's probably going to be out. Um, are there any other changes would you make? Do you, uh, do you feel like Tomlin's ready to come back in or would you keep things largely the same? It purely depends how well Tomlin trains, doesn't it? Um, if he's fit and available, then I think you have to play him purely because that's where the creativity comes from. Him and Kiefer mm-hmm. need to build up a rapport <laughs> and sort of really get a good understanding because that could be a frightful partnership I don't think we've really talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, if, if Tomlin's fit, then Tomlin comes in, but then who do you drop? I thought Raz was good, Bakuna was good, and Pack was good. Well, who who would you drop? Uh, first instinct, who would you drop from that three? I've got mine in my head. Bakuna. Yeah, Bakuna. Tom? Yeah, probably the same, to be honest. Yeah. And, and that's, that's Bakuna. That's I what I was about to say. It's unfair, isn't it? And it's weird, because we're talking about, you know, the, the lack of depth and things like that, but then you also, who would you drop? Who would you change? And, and looking at the starting 11 yesterday, apart from Tomlin coming in, I don't think there's a, a change I would make. If Murphy was fit, Maybe put him in, but I don't think either winger did enough to be dropped yesterday. I think Ojo, you know, needs more time to play. And I think Hoylet was, especially in the first half, he was very busy. And he yeah. seemed to get himself stuck in. So there's, yeah, there's, not a, uh, there's, not an, and there's not an instinctive change that I can see that I would want to make at this stage. I agree. Which is, which is probably a good thing, really. But, I, you know, we need to breed that consistency. Um, we, we've talked about Reading. Obviously, their danger man, Ajaria, Lucas Shaw. Is there anyone else that you pick out there, Ben? Or, you know, you, you said you'll make support him. Is there anyone he's, he's let us know about the week that's flying under the radar? Not really. He sort of just doesn't, can't work out how they've started so well. I know it's only two games, but he's yeah. sort of confused by it. But, um, yeah, I think that we saw, like, we saw what happened last year when we went to them. They're... They're not a bad side. They sort of had an average, average season last year. They sort of fell off below where they expected to be. Mm-hmm. But they've got some good young players. They spent a fair bit of money. And I don't think it's going to be a comfortable, easy win. I really don't. Um, they could easily, if they're on form, come and do us 3 0 again. Um, yeah, did, did we play them last season four times? Because we played them yeah, a couple times. Yeah, the most dire well. FA Cup games going. Yeah, and I mean, even in the FA Cup game, their their goal, I think the one all at Medeski, it shouldn't have been a goal. I can't remember if it was offside. I think he was offside. Yeah, comfortably offside, yeah. wasn't he? He was, was like three yards offside. offside, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. so it's, they always seem to get that bit of luck against us. It's like that Federici goal in the 96th minute. There's no yeah. way they score that in any other game apart from against us. Uh, let's let's get your predictions in now. Go on, in, Ben. What do you think? Uh, I one all draw. One all draw. Uh, who's going to score? Kiefer Moore. Uh, Hoylet Hoylet no, it doesn't rhyme Tom uh, I reckon we win 3-0 uh, who's going to score Kiefer Moore uh, uh, I think um, <laughs> Morrison to score first against his old side yes narrative um, we, we should probably revisit at some point Sean Morrison's serial club um, when he was at Reading he was trying <laughs> to eat as much cereal as possible maybe let's put that in for next week post Reading um, <laughs> I'm going to go Cardiff 2-0 uh, I think we're going to keep you know we're going to every game is going to be 2-0 for us uh, this season we're either going to win 2-0 lose 2-0 but I think Kiefer Moore and if Tomlin's back in I think Tomlin's going to get a cheeky goal as well uh, to kind of carry on the march up the league uh, and talking about marching up the league it's time to reveal the view from Minion Hall of Fame uh, so this is our regular feature where we're, we're trying to compile the kind of most esoteric perhaps 
view from the Ninian Hall of Fame, all related to Cardiff City. Um, the, the first week's winner went to Tom Phillips with the Michael Chopra's boot celebration. Uh, and this week's winner was um, a drum roll, please. Uh, it was Ben Price with the, the Gavor Sheepest rugby tackle. Uh, he went big. Um, he went big with that. The, the other options were Leon Barnett's loan from Tom. That was a 13% boat share. So not oh. as good, Tom. It got a like um, from Leon Barnett, though. <laughs> it did get a like from Leon Barnett. And that's probably the real quiz, isn't it? That is the real <laughs> quiz. Um, and then I went for Dave Marshall's save against Swansea, which actually got 32% of the vote. So it was a bit tighter than I was anticipating. Um, but obviously, Ben ran out the winner with Gabriel Gipesh's rugby tackle. Um, I do follow him on Instagram. I am going to try and get him on the podcast at some point to talk about that rugby tackle. So um, if he's listening, that's the, that's the invite, Gabor. Um, so that leaves a, a one in the win column for Tom, a one in the win column for Ben Price, and I'm stuck on zero still. But I feel like this is my week. Um, we've all got our choices this week. And um, because you won, Ben, you can go first. Okay. My nomination is for Sean Morrison's dog, Pippa. Um... I follow Sean Morrison's missus on Instagram. She's hilarious. She's blunt as fuck. But her dog, their dog is amazing. Just everyone likes a dog anyway. Mm -hmm. But yeah, just a really funny dog that seems to get in, like have standoff with cows that are at Sean Morrison's back garden. What else yeah. is it? It's just a dog. I, I was going to say, feel like the dog has like a classic scrape every week where it rolls in cow shit <laughs> or does something like that. It, 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 seems, it seems like living with Pippa would be an event. A good a good event or a bad event? Always oh, a good event. About. It's 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 an adventure with a dog. It's yeah, going to be good. So that's your vote then, Sean Morrison's dog. Yes. All right, Tom, you go next. I'm going to take you back to, you know, 2008 when you had the likes of Alicia Keys, Coldplay, Rihanna, Lil Wayne, Flo Rider in the charts. <laughs> but you know, the the song that went under the radar wasn't even our official FA Cup song. Was Cardiff City fans do the Ayatollah? Mm -hmm. and, you, and you know I think there's lyrics in it that not even McCartney and Lennon would have come up with um, you know we're, we're Cardiff City we're off to Wembley and when we lift the cup it's going to be tidy you know you can't there's genius in there you know we, we set a big trap for Harry Redknapp and we're going to give his football team a big slap but you don't hear lyrics like that these days and you know you had, you had filming inside the ground you had it out to the ground with the, the marvellous Cardiff City Football Club and the outside of Ninian Park and, you know, you've got them doing the Ayatollah walking down Caroline Street. And like, the, the choreography as well. Don't forget that. Oh, that's that fantastic. Just... It's peak Cardiff City. You know, some probably lines you wouldn't say in the, in the, in the modern times now and there as well. Some stereotypes about sheep and things like that as well. You know, a few of those uh, put in there. But, you know, ignoring that, I think it's an absolute classic and deserves to go into the Hall of Fame. I'm not trying to help out your vote here, but his jeans are particularly um, beautiful as well. <laughs> yeah. Like a, a big boot cut jean, which you don't see very often these days. But I do predict they're going to come back in 2021. <laughs> um, uh, I guess I'll round it off this week with, um, I don't know if anyone will remember this, but um, it's from the 2002-2003 season. It was when we had the likes of Peter Thorne, Robert Earnshaw, Andy Campbell as our, as our strikers. Um, but it was a goal from Leo Fortune West that will always remain in my mind. Uh, it was a home game against the might of Port Vale uh, early on in the season. I think it was sort of, um, what, what kind of time of the year? It must have been August, September time. So it was a sunny Tuesday evening at, uh, against Port Vale. And, and Leo Fortune West got a surprise start alongside looks like Campbell and Thorne, from what I can see, which is a, an odd forward three. Um, you expect Peter Thorne or Andy Campbell to get the plaudits. No, it was Leo Fortune West. He scored this goal, which Thorne flicks it on. Leo Fortune West flicks it back to Thorne and the ball comes back through to him. He's on the left of the box. He manages to Cruyff turn back inside a defender, which I don't think Leo Fortune West knew that he could do. And with the outside of his left boot, one touch, he curls it across the keeper into the top corner. In a, a show of skill that if Messi would, had done it, we'd still be talking about it today. But instead it was Heraklion Leo Fortune West, um, probably the greatest striker that Cardiff City have ever had. And, and that's my nomination for, for this week's View from Minion Hall of Fame. Um, I don't think I'm going to win. I've got uh, an idea in my head who's going to win. I think it's going to be Tom Phillips again this week. I've got big again. Sorry, I had a bit of a mental block. I, know, I, went for the, I didn't go for the official FA Cup song, so I think it's niche enough. I went to the, um, I went to the official launch of that FA Cup song um, at the Hard Rock Cafe in Cardiff. Class. And, um, Peter Ridsdale was very happy to sing along, especially the bits that were about him. Um, <laughs> so says all you need to know about Peter Ridsdale. 
Um, <laughs> and with that note, because I don't know why we should all, never end a podcast on a Peter Ridsdale, I'm going to go back to my holiday because it's sunny and it's almost midday and I want to eat some souvlaki. Um, so, boys, pleasure as always. Um, we'll be back next week after the Reading game. I guess that's next Sunday. And when I'll be back from holiday and tanned, um, Ben will be out of his best and Tom will have had a haircut. So, boys, see you next week. All the best. See you. They may not be that smart and they may not be that pretty, but they like to talk about Cardiff City. It's the view from the ninny and with views from the ninny and not shoes from the ninny and the view from the ninny and...